Let's face it. When it comes to cats, we aren't their owners. We're more like guardians. But do we know all we need to know before we take on the task? PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk tells us the 250 things your cat wants you to know. It's an education in cats. Next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's show, PETA President Ingrid Newkirk has another book out. This one's about cats. Titled 250 Vital Things Your Cat Wants You to Know, The Cat Guardian's Bible, it's out right now. And if you have a cat or are thinking about getting one, this is the pre-owner's manual. Here's my conversation with PETA President Ingrid Newkirk on the PETA podcast. So let me ask you about this, uh, you know, this cat thing. Uh, I think everything we need to know is in the title, the Cat Guardian's Bible. We're cat guardians, right? Is that is that the realization that we are, in fact, just guardians? We are, because I think ownership is a word that doesn't really apply when it comes to cats. I mean, it's a word you can use to describe your relationship with a pair of sneakers, yeah. um, but not with a cat. Yeah, I mean, they're special. I mean, every, everyone notices that cats are different. They're different from other, and I know we've gone through the, they're not pets, they're companions, right? The companion animals. But cats are different from, from dogs, and we're not the boss of them, really, are we? We are not the boss of them. That is quite correct. <laughs> they're far more reliable. They're better behaved. They're more attentive. And I think they're, more, they're much more clean, cleaner than, than most human beings. And I think the condition of our houses probably scandalizes them. Yeah. And you say, you use a, a word that kind of got me in some of the uh, materials to, to publicize the book, the idea of we are being supervised by the cats. It's true. I mean, they're very, very attentive and they watch you like a hawk. I probably can't use hawk and cat together, but they, they watch you um, carefully to make sure what you're doing. Like dogs, they have to because you do control their lives whether they come or go and what condition they're in and how amused they are. But yes, they've got their eye on you because you are the controller of the can opener and things like that. I mean, you know, your your cat in Spain is the decider on whether or not you get custody of your children in a divorce. Really? Did you know that? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, because this is a new thing, relatively new, but it's the way it should be. <laughs> but, <laughs> When you're in divorce court, the judge will ask if you have a cat. And if you have a cat, the judge wants a social service person to investigate how you've treated that cat. And the person of the two who are divorcing, who treated the cat best, is better as the one who gets custody of the children. So that's a fact. <laughs> so it's a kind of cat justice. Yeah, absolutely is. And I mean, Europe is getting some more progressive animal laws, even things like goldfishes in a bowl, is that now the RSPCA and other places, Italy, Spain, require a certain amount of surface area and a certain amount of swimming area so that your uh, fish can be better treated and more respected. So cats, yeah, we should be able to figure that out, what they need, and give it to them. And and how we treat them is important. I mean, it's not irrelevant or trivial to say how you treat a cat or how you treat an animal is indicative of the kind of person you are. Yes, I think Mark Twain said something to that effect, and others have too. Um, I mean, it's as you treat your child or you treat any other living being, especially if you have control over them. And historically, we haven't done so brilliantly with how we've kept cats. We've done all all sorts of awful things to them. And today, I mean, cats are often kept as rat catchers still, which means they're chucked out into the barn 
and they're supposed to earn their living by catching rodents, which isn't very nice for the rodents. There are other ways to control them if you don't want them there. But they also pass on diseases to the cats. So cats get all sorts of things like leptospirosis and fleas and tapeworms and all sorts of things from catching rats and mice. So one of the things we don't do is keep them indoors where they're safe, and we should do that. Yeah, and, and these are all things that, yeah, you know, when the cats get something, they pass it on to humans? They certainly can. I mean, toxoplasmosis is a case in point, and we're seeing more and more cases of toxoplasmosis in these poor cats who live outdoors. I mean, I, I think this whole thing of feral cats, because they're not truly feral, you know, a lot of shelters are chucking them out and just saying, good luck, you know, here's a, a packed lunch, get on with it. And they have to exist in summer. They have to go through heat looking for water. In winter, everything ices up. They can't get it. But they kill in order to survive. They get toxoplasmosis, which is passed on in their fecal matter. And so, I mean, you can, if you let your cat out and bring your cat back in, they can pass on toxoplasmosis in the litter box. Another reason to keep it impeccably clean. Um, and you can get it. it. These little cysts go up into your brain, and it's actually believed to be linked to schizophrenia. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's great. Well, see, all this we would know if only we could talk or communicate with our cats or if they can communicate with us. Hence, the importance of 250 vital things your cat wants you to know, the Cat Guardian's Bible, which is your new book, which is, uh, I guess there was a there was a, a pressing need for all these things that people are just kind of ignorant about. Oh, there is, Emil, because... You know, even the best of us, I mean, I look back at things I've done and, and really can't undo them, do regret them. I used to let my cats out. I thought it was cruel not to. And, of course, the list in the book of what you uh, expose them to, if you do just open the door and, and wish them goodbye, is uh, dogs, raccoons, um, evil people. I used to be a humane officer in Montgomery County, Maryland, and used to find actual bits of cats used in satanic rituals. They kill wildlife. They do get diseases, as you've said, and they can get run over. You know, <laughs> you know, pave paradise and put up a parking lot. It used to be a paradise, and now there are four-lane highways. There are big trucks. And one of the things I did was let my cats out, and one dear cat... And we were on a dead-end street. I thought, oh, she never goes anywhere. She just potters around the, the yard. Took her three days. I looked and looked. And then three days before she crawled home with her crushed ribs and died on my back stoop. So never again. But that's not the way to learn. And so I'm hoping the book will help people not make the same mistakes I did and to be able to safeguard their cats and love them and respect them and look after them and make them really, really happy. Okay, we're going to get into some of those vital things that your cats want you to know, but was there one thing in particular that made you say, because you've written a number of books in the past, uh, and there are so many other issues uh, around you know, animal rights that you are concerned about, but is there something that that struck you as, oh, I've got, this is going to be the subject of my next book. Is there something that happened to you? Well, there are many things that I shouldn't have done that I did that I don't want other people to run afoul of. But really, the impetus was from the cats in the Peter Norfolk headquarters office. We know that even though they have the entire run of the fourth floor, they can go in and out. We have little holes in every wall, including in the restrooms, so there's no privacy for anyone, that they are, still have a limited life. And so we're always trying to do things for them. If I go outside, um, which I do, they don't, I collect feathers that I find dropped on the ground, and we now have, everybody started to do it, a giant box of feathers from all sorts of birds, from all over the world. And the cats roll in this box. They inhale the feathers, and they have a wonderful time. 
We look for toys all the time. We make sure we play with them every evening. We have things um, constructed by the windows so they have a room with a view and an outside view and they can catch the sun at certain times of the day. But still I know their lives are limited. As much as we love them and care for them and try to cater to them, it's not enough. And I thought, I need to collect all the things we do and all the things we definitely don't want to do, shouldn't do, and stick them in a book so it's easy reading, including things like watch what house plants you have. You know, you don't want to make a mistake there and bring in a plant or get a gift of a plant that ends up hurting your cat. Okay, so uh, watch for your plants and also make sure your cat is exposed to all uh, uh, the feather fetishes it, it desires. <laughs> so, yes. So, all right, so let's go down some of the, uh, in the time that we have, uh, let's go down some of the, the items in 250 Vital Things Your Cat Wants You to Know, the Cat Guardian's Bible. First of all, I guess we really should know how long their life expectancy is, how long they, they can live, right? Well, cats can reach voting age if you look after them properly, and they might do better than we do at the polls. But yes, um, it depends, you know, on their genetic makeup, their background, what they've been through as kids, uh, and so on. But the big thing is, if you are sure to look after them, and, and I would suggest uh, when you feed them, don't feed them the same old muck, even if it's expensive muck that comes from uh, the slaughterhouse. I would cook for my cat, and people may go, I'm not cooking for my cat. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you can, and I've got recipes, but you can buy wonderful, healthy, organic, truly humane foods, which I list, like V-cat, veggie cat. But whatever you're feeding, put in a little crushed garlic, a little thyme, a little rosemary, a little parsley. Give them something other than those ground-up organ meats. Deflee them regularly and properly. Don't let them be scratching about the house and do their bedding when you do them. And here's a tip is that most people are really confused by the array of products you can buy to deflee your cat when actually regular soapy water does the trick just as well as anything else. You just have to be sure. Don't get it in their eyes and don't get it down their uh, ears. Yeah. And it's best to wrap them up in something that's porous, like um, a see-through grocery a sack, a cotton grocery sack or something, so that they and give them something to stand on that that they can grab onto in the tub. And so I have lots of, of hints about that. So but, just keep them clean, and soapy water is enough to deflee. And it is, yeah. and you must do their bedding. And of course, if you've got fleas that have uh, become made your house their home too, then you'll need to deflee that. And I've got some tips about what to do. You can't have the cats indoors when you're defleeing, but there are very humane and organic and healthy ways to deflee, like using diatomaceous earth, for example, on the carpet. Remove the cats and then leave it overnight, go and vacuum it up in the morning. Um, but do, you know, there, there are things to look out for. You do have to know a cat is not the easy keeper he or she may appear. Lots, is, lots can be going on inside a cat, and you have yeah. to be attentive uh, to that, as well as always play with them. They can't just see you as a blur yeah. who comes in and out of the house, you know? Yeah, and I, I gather from uh, what, what you were saying uh, a minute ago, don't just feed them the regular muck. I slip in some garlic and some thyme. Uh, take up uh, a, a, your avocation as a cat chef. They want variety. Is that what you're saying? They love. I mean, don't we all? And I know some people whose cats love pizza. They love um, almond milk or almond ice cream, soy ice cream. They uh, love to have fresh grasses, of course. And again, you do have to be a little careful. There are some grasses like oat grass you should probably not um, give them, although oat grass will probably make them chuck up a hairball, and that's probably okay too. Um, 
and you shouldn't leave dry food out overnight. You should look at it carefully, seal the top of it because it can get a fungus or it can get bacteria and then it can give them an upset. But melon balls, some of them love steamed broccoli. Marshall, who lived in our (laughs) office for years, adored steamed broccoli. He would run a mile if he could smell someone had steamed broccoli. Steamed broccoli. Boy, that's a picky cat eater. (laughs) <laughs> See, only the steamed broccoli, not the raw, chewy, crispy no, broccoli. Only the steamed. And we have another cat, Brandy. Bless her heart. She came from the Louisiana oil spill, and she almost had no hair when we got her from just psychological stress. They can get so worked up about things. And she just loves um Fake meat. If you give her Gardein oh. Tofurky slices, she will just be in love with you forever. And don't try to slip her the, uh, you know, any any other brand. Uh, you know, Morningstar Farms, <laughs> no, it's not vegan. Well, some of it's vegan, but no, is she particular in that way or she just likes fake meat? She loves fake meat. And in fact, she also likes beans and a burrito. Oh, well, there. So there's some variety. So, all right. So you got to feed them well. You got to take care of them. You got to deflee them. Don't let your cats outdoors because then they're out there in the food chain and who knows what's going to happen. They get all these kind of diseases. Now, what do you, how do you make sure that they're happy without letting them out? Well, a cat will let you know if they're happy or unhappy, usually. And it goes from dirty looks to hissing at you, um, to cuddling up with you and asking for attention because they're saying, hello, I'm here, remember me? I mean, perhaps you have a partner in the house. (laughs) You should never let anybody push a cat off the bed or the couch. That's so insulting. They will remember that and they will resent it. They do. They Um, remember. They have short memories. Like if I push a cat off the bed. Oh, I'm how many. Oh, is that like a month's worth of cat uh, vengeance or. It could be for their whole nine lives that they'll remember you, Emil, in the wrong kind of way. <laughs> I'm never pushing a cat off a bed again. They get to stay. But, you know, you have to figure out what's going on in their lives. I mean, one of the things I touched on litter, but litter is so important. I mean, imagine if you went into your bathroom and had to step in waste. I mean, I hate to say it, but, oh, my God, you'd be upset. And it's the same with them. They're fastidious. And so you do have to watch the litter box many times a day. And I know people who think, oh, I'll get to it, and don't. Or they have one of those ghastly self-cleaning, so-called, litter boxes, which are frightening to many cats and which don't do a good job because they hold the waste under the tray. Cats don't want to sniff that. They want to put their pristine little feet into clean litter. So you have to clean it at least once a week. But, I mean, provide for your cat. You make them happy by giving them something simple. A cardboard box. It might just look like a clump of useless cardboard to you. A cardboard box, any size. They'll squeeze into a tiny one. They'll lounge in a big one. A cardboard <laughs> box is cat heaven. <laughs> yeah. And then if you put a little catnip on it, oh, my goodness, then it really is heaven. Yes, and you can watch them hallucinate. But one other thing is do give them a view, because even if you have to drag a dresser over to the window, maybe the windowsill is too small a ledge. Maybe they have to have a really svelte bottom to get on that small ledge, and they're like Renoir's women, not like that. I mean, you drag something over so that they can get on it and look out and they're like the nosy neighbor and bewitched. Yeah. I mean, they want to look behind, see what's going on. And they're professional bird watchers. So give them some, maybe put a bird feeder outside the window if you can. So that's one of the 250 vital things your cat wants you to know. The cat wants a view. Yes. He wants, and so it may <laughs> add to the rent, may add to the mortgage, but a view is what your cat demands. I, I notice this. When I see a cat always like, you know, they, when we leave, there's a cat looking out the door waiting for us to come back. So I, I know that I know that they want the view. And I don't think they're really looking for me to come back. I, they just want to see the traffic. They just want to see what's outside. 
A view is well, they're not looking for you if you kick them off the couch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they probably are looking for you if they love you and, and they know that you look out for them. And you know they will squint at you uh, if they're really feeling affectionate. They will just gradually put their eyes together, and it means, I just adore you. Thank you for existing. So that's a cat smile, you say, the squintiness. It is, just as that question mark tail is a happy tail, too, opposed to the thump, thump, thump tail, which means watch it, Buster. Yeah, so, uh, squinting, bad for politicians, but great for cats. That means the cat loves you. <laughs> so. That's right, and they're, they're more honest, too. All right, now I talked about um, catnip. Catnip is sometimes like the, the be-all, end, you know, the, it's it's the, the thing that, okay, the cat's not happy, I'll give it catnip and you know they'll go crazy but you is that can people overdo catnip oh yes i think you need to grow natural grasses they're they're better for their teeth they're better for their digestion and they amuse them and they smell them and so on i have a cat bubbles i did not give her that name she's a rescued (laughs) cat it's an embarrassing name but bubbles adores bamboo Oh. And she will rub against it and so on. She couldn't care about magnolia or any of the other things. I bring her bamboo. She adores. But yes, you can overdo it with catnip. And catnip mustn't become some sort of substitute for you paying attention, grooming, massaging your cat. Bubbles loves a gentle massage every morning while I'm eating my bean burrito. Yeah, you know, I notice that the cat likes it, especially when I I touch her in places that she can't get to, like the back of her neck and, you know, well, she can get to that by rubbing up against something else. But yeah, they they like that. And then, but only for a few seconds. Now, what does it mean when they don't want, they don't want it a little bit. They know when it's enough because they'll they'll move away, right? You you just can't do it. That can't be your go-to move all the time. Yes, and you have to be gentle. You have to remember, I mean, we're giant aliens, and they may seem self-sufficient and so on, and they are, but they really are tiny. Um, But I'll tell you a horror story, if I may, Emil. Go ahead, please. There's somebody who just loved his cat, but as his cat got older, uh, his cat became terribly grumpy, and if he would go to pet this cat, the cat would spit and hiss at him and get, get really upset. And um, he said, I asked him, you know, what, what's wrong? And he said, oh, it's just old age, getting to be a real grump. And then one day, he took his cat to the vet for something routine. And the cat said, he told the, the vet this. And the cat said, the vet said, put the cat on the floor, will you? So he did. And the cat went around the room walking and was having trouble with it. And the vet said, you know... Your cat has something seriously wrong. The cat had a brain tumor. It was affecting him to the degree that when someone went to touch his head, he was very nervous and very upset. And so I find that people sometimes just attribute things to old age. And old age isn't a disease. There are things you get as you age, but each one is a symptom of something that's happening. And so... You have to be careful. If you touch your cat and your cat is sensitive, make sure there isn't something going on. The reason that this man hadn't seen that his cat was having trouble with his vision because of the brain tumor is that the cat knew his way around that house. had been there for years, but put on the floor of the vet's office, he couldn't really manage. And they, they took a, an x-ray or whatever they do, and found that he had been in pain for quite a long time. So oh, never just just brush it off as, oh, he's grumpy, or oh, he doesn't want to play. Maybe, but maybe not. All right, so that's one thing. You know, investigate these uh, things. It, it might be, you know, it might seem odd. You just can't make assumptions. But sometimes when cats do communicate, they do things like they'll scratch furniture, or they'll scratch, uh, you know, they'll scratch things that you know or that they know you'll react to and, you know, you'll respond to them. What do you do about a scratching cat? What, what, what are some things that people can do? Well, fish got to swim and cats got to scratch. I mean, it's just part of their lives. 
you cannot punish a cat for scratching. What you can do is try to get a cat not to scratch where you don't want them to do. For example, you don't want your couch to be shredded. So there are things you can do. First, make sure you've got good places for the cat to scratch. Drag in a a stump from the woods. I mean, bang it about and leave it outside for a while to get rid of little resident insects. But give them a stump. Give them scratching posts in various places. Give them a sisal-covered cat tree. Most important, make sure you're cutting their nails, that you're trimming their nails. Because there's a quick in there, you can easily learn how to not touch the quick. Because if you cut the quick, they'll never let you touch them again. But if you if you're too nervous, get the vet to do it. The more you do it, the more the quick recedes. Never, ever, 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 ever declaw a cat. That is not a simple procedure. I would put vets in jail for doing it if I had my druthers. They know better. For them, it's a money proposition. For the cat, you look at your fingers. You know, you don't just take off the nail. The vet takes off that first phalange, that first segment of the finger. That's so painful. Some of them will never use the litter box again because it's too painful. Some of them will get back problems because they can't walk properly. I mean, where did we get the word catwalk from? That beautiful coming down the catwalk. They can't do that if you've taken the nubs off their, off their digits. And so never do that. You can, if you're still having trouble, spray that edge of the couch or whatever it is with a little bit of peppermint. They don't like peppermint usually or, or lime or just cover it for a while. And when they go there, pick them up gently, put them on what you want them to trim their own nails on and help them scratch just as they would move their paws in a litter box. See, now this is no minor point that you're getting into this idea of declawing. Declawing really should be illegal, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, in certain countries, you can't cut a dog's ears so that it's cosmetically appealing. If you want to hack and mutilate your cat's feet, then is your couch really more important than a cat? Don't have a cat. Get a wind-up toy or something. It's just absolutely unforgivable. Yeah. Now, Ingrid, in the time remaining we have with you, I'm sure that people who are listening who are dog lovers are saying, yeah, see, that's why I'm a dog lover. That's why we have, you know, I... You don't really get into the debate, cat or dogs, but how do you respond to people who are just adamantly chauvinistic about dogs Um, in the same way that people are adamantly chauvinistic about cats? I mean, how do you bridge the gap between the two? Oh, it's so funny because, you know, some people say I would never have a cat or I don't like cats. It's a kind of odd thing to say. It's like saying I don't like people from Lithuania. I don't know. Have you ever met one? You know, I, I, <laughs> I like them. I like... <laughs> so it's it's very odd, isn't it? Because um, I've known people. So many people have told me stories about, say, a husband. Sorry to pick on husbands, but a husband who said, "Don't you bring a cat? I don't like cats." And then, of course, they fall hopelessly in love with the cat who comes in, and the cat becomes their cat, and the cat sleeps on their chest. So it's a question of familiarity, I think, more than anything. And people who perhaps have grown up with dogs, I certainly grew up with a dog, think, well, there's nothing more special than a dog. Just means that you don't know cats. They're all special in a particular important way way that you just haven't discovered yet they're all fabulous yeah i yeah i thought i was one way and then i got one and then i was the other way and you know yeah you're right it's just that we don't know which is why 250 vital things your cat wants you to know the cat guardian's bible is important so if people read this Will they know everything about cat body language and, you know, when to give your cat a birthday gift or, you know, what cat holidays to celebrate? Will they know all that? They'll know everything, Emil. They'll know absolutely (laughs) everything in the world there is to know about cats. No, I can't promise that. They will know something about the history of what we've done to cats. 
they'll know something about cat language, cat communication, why it's what to do if the horrible day arrives, which it did for me, never thought it would, when your cat goes missing and you are just beside yourself. They'll learn a lot about cats, um, but I may have to do a sequel to make it sure we've got everything covered. Well, what do, you, what do you do when your cat goes away? I mean, we didn't really cover that when they go missing. What should you do? Oh, Lord, it's a nightmare. You know, in my case, I had a cat called Moomin, who was an orphan cat. And um, I always kept her inside at that point because I'd had the awful incident with my other cat getting hit by a car. And one night, it was very hot in Washington, Um, and I had gone out, I just cracked the window somewhere in the one room, gone out to an event, come back, and she wasn't there. And I thought, well, Lord, where is she? So I looked everywhere, couldn't find her, um, scoured the neighborhood, looked the next morning, nothing. Um, it was 11 days, Emil. I mean, I was so lucky to have got her back. What she did is she... And she crept out of the uh, window, crossed the very quiet street at night when there was no traffic on it. We had a big street outside the house. Um, Walked away looking for things. It started to rain, so she hid under a bush. The next morning, she tried to come back, and I'll tell you why I know all this. She tried to come back, but now the road was full of rush hour traffic. And she was petrified, so she turned back again and kept walking uh, further and further away, about a mile away. I, I, I did everything I say in the book to do because I know it's all vital. Go to every shelter yourself personally and look because the people are busy and just calling them. It may not get recorded. The wrong person may not see your cat. Make sure your cat's microchipped. Go out at night and call down drains and in, because they wedge themselves in teeny crevices. And sometimes they get stuck. They get stuck inside a wheel well of a car, for example. They get stuck inside a pipe somewhere. So call and listen. Talk to every child, every mail carrier. And what I did, which saved the day, is I got big pieces of plywood and I spray painted reward cat and the, just the color of the cat, not male or female, because people get that wrong. And they go, well, that's not this one then. Um, and the number. And I made sure I was at that number. That number was answered all the time. And, and people Someone respond. called me. Yeah. Somebody called me and she said, You're, I think I've got your cat. She said, I was going to keep her. She's been eating out of my cat's bowl. She's living under the porch, but I think that's her. And I ran. I found her, and she was thin. She was scared. She'd lost weight. In that 11 days, she must have heard every raccoon passing through that yard. And I was so happy. I was just crying, Emil. I brought her home and put her on my bed. But, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's true that they're out there when they're outdoors, and I understand it's getting cold now, and they like to go under cars. They like to, they end up, like, like you know, in the motor area at times. They do, yeah, because the motor, if you turned it off, that motor is still uh, retaining some heat, generating some heat, and if cats are out and it's raining, for example, and they get up under the motor, um, there have been terrible stories, even cats going miles and miles inside a car and then someone hearing the mew and realizing, oh, Lord, there's a kitten or a cat up inside my motor. They get stuck. They can get torn apart by the fan belt. So we always say in winter, knock on the hood of your car before you start it to make sure you're getting a cat out or a raccoon out or a possum out perhaps. Um, before, because you never know. But if your cat goes missing, your cat can go a long way by being somewhere under a car or a truck or UPS deli- delivery truck, something. So you never know. You have to really be diligent to get them back. See, uh, Ingrid, this is a lot of information in 250 Vital Things Your Cat Wants You to Know, The Cat Guardian's Bible, your new book. And we have just a few seconds really but i want to go into a lightning round because there's some things that we didn't get to 
and and they're pretty easy, I think. Are two cats better than one? Absolutely, because they can keep to themselves company when you're at work or school or at the movies. All right, but three. There's got to be a limited three cats are not better than two. Well, three's okay. Um, <laughs> and we, we, have, we have three. You just must be careful not to become a hoarder because they get respiratory problems if there are too many cats in an enclosed space, and that makes their entire lives miserable. Okay, just a few more lightning round. Can cats walk on a leash like a dog? They can walk on a harness, yes. Best if you if you uh, teach them when they're kittens, but most can get used to it. And that's nice because you can take them on a chaperoned um, walk. They can smell the grass and roll in it and so on. And you're right there if a dog comes along or anything else happens. Okay. And what, what, why do cats make what you call biscuits on your lap? Oh, when they need, they need that dough on your lap is they miss their mommy and they remember that lovely sensation of when they were nursing. So they're just reliving their childhood memories. See, when you, when you say things like that, I mean, when you hear people say, oh, well, cats are feral, they're wild and, and you know, cats should be community cats and they notch their ears and they send them out into the streets and they don't really foster them and they make, they make everyone in the community take care of them. That's such a bad idea after you hear stories about cats wanting to make biscuits on your lap. <laughs> well, it sounds good is that you don't, don't have to do anything but just let them out there. But most of these cats, they don't fare well. They get eye infections. They get respiratory disease. They suffer from parasites out there. They're bitterly cold when the ice and the snow and the winds come and the storms. And they have a very hard life out there. So I always think, would you take your dearly loved cat who's asleep now on this perch behind me in the sun and just chuck him outside and say, so long, hope you manage. You know, all our cats at home, they get all sorts of problems. You know, they'll get a kidney problem or a heart problem or they'll injure themselves or they need vaccines. They don't get any of that stuff out there. And how do they die? out there. They don't die of healthy old age in their sleep. They deteriorate and they're not in good shape at all by the time they go or they meet an accident or an evil person or something. See, and we, we, we need to, we don't need to experience all that stuff when it, you know, as it happens, we can just read your book, 250 vital things your cat wants you to know the cat guardians Bible. It's kind of a cat education really. Yes, I hope so. I hope people come away going, gosh, I know who to give this book to. That person next door who lets their cat out, yeah. or that person whose cat has fleas, or whatever it is. But yes, there are lots of fun things to do, lots of fun ideas in it, and lots of very practical things that make sure your cat loves you, you love your cat, and your cat lives to a fine, old, healthy old age. Well, Ingrid Newkirk, uh, really, uh, thank you for your time and thank you for the book. Good luck on it. It comes out. The release date is November 6th, but people should pre-order if uh, they get this before the 6th or they can just go to Amazon and leave a review when they read it. It's 250 vital things your cat wants you to know, the Cat Guardian's Bible. And was, was this one of the more fun books you, you've had to put together and write? Oh, yes, absolutely. And my cats looked over my shoulder to make sure I was getting it right. <laughs> well, you had, a, you had an editor and a cat editor, too. So <laughs> Three of them. <laughs> yeah. Ingrid, thank you very much for being on the PETA podcast. Oh, thank you, Emil, very much. PETA President Ingrid Newkirk. Her three cats approved the book. So now you know it's the good stuff is all in there. 250 vital things your cat wants you to know. The Cat Guardian's Bible. Ingrid Newkirk's new book. Available wherever you buy your books. Go to PETA.org for more information. And 
that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or see my vlog at amok.com, or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, at ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.